you never know what each season is going to hold. And for me, walking into base camp, I always feel excited. And it, this path here gives me a feeling that I don't get anywhere else in my life. And it's the same feeling whether I'm going to go and climb or whether I'm just trekking into base camp. And it's kind of like going home. We're now in Kathmandu, which is the capital of Nepal, and it's a pretty big and overcrowded city. And the city itself is sort of outgrown its own infrastructure. You know, the city of Kathmandu is a sort of chaotic and crazy place, but it feels comfortable. It feels like, you know, this big crazy city where you come and you meet all your friends and you can all laugh about the same things. and you all kind of can appreciate the chaos together, so it's kind of become my home. We're on our way right now to go see Miss Holly, who is the historian who keeps all of the records on Everest climbers. And Subin, when did Miss Holly first arrive in Kathmandu? Oh, Miss Holly? Yeah. Oh, 1960. 1960. <coughs> so. Now it's 2015. She's been here since 1960. How many sugars are coming with you? One. Oxygen? Taking oxygen? Taking oxygen, but my intention is to climb without. These poor fellows are very uh, These poor I'm fellows. Oxygen. It's better than so weak. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> I'm sure there's more women. But they're not outstanding except for Melissa. She makes an impression on me, I can tell you. That she's a very resourceful, very nice, very active woman. You did some unknown peaks. That was mountaineering. On our way to the domestic airport to fly to Lukla this morning, and it's always a bit of a nerve wracking process. I think I feel more humble in a way. I feel like the first thing I want to tell people is not that I've achieved success on Everest in the past, it's that achieving success and getting to the summit is absolutely uncertain no matter what. I think I've learned that. Landed in Lukla on this tiny little twin otter. The plane is about to come to a stop. There you go. We're here. So now it really begins. These planes are the last motorized transport, and we're going to walk the entire rest of the way. The trek to Everest Base Camp takes about 10 days, and I've sort of procured this really specific route that I go and it's it's not the typical route into Everest Base Camp but it takes us over two high passes that are both at around 17,500 feet and so we get to base camp feeling a little more acclimatized than you do on the normal route. I love taking people, clients, into this journey and this place that you know we hike for 10 days and we stay in tiny little tea houses and all of the tea houses we stay in along the way are owned by my friends and my family, my Nepali family, really. So there's our first view of Everest, and we scrambled off of the main trail here to get this really special little view, and you can actually see the entirety of climbing on Summit Day, from the South Col all the way up the triangular face, 
to the south summit and then the summit proper and it always is a really special thing to see Everest and it has sort of power and absolutely a power over me that's hard to explain. We're up here in Namche, which is at 11,200 feet, and it's the Sherpa capital. It's one of the biggest villages in the entire Khumbu Valley. And for me, coming up here is sort of like going home. If I have any village that feels like home for me, it's this one. And the family that lives at this house has really become my sort of adopted Sherpa family. Rituals and customs are completely central to the Sherpa culture and a scarf around your neck to say goodbye to you and wish you luck when you're leaving and it's called a kata and I have that experience in nearly all the Sherpa homes that I go to. Oh yes, love to see her. It's, I feel like she's my daughter, second daughter. She's, she has done a lot of things. I mean the amazing, you know, she's amazing girl. I've seen her, she's so kind, she's so good to everybody, and she has very good heart. That's the most important thing. We are doing this. <laughs> this is happening. I think the first word that comes to mind with, about Melissa's relationship with the Sherpa and the people here is just genuine. <laughs> she's genuinely family in all of the places that we go. She cares, and they care. We're playing with kids and families and we're welcomed like family everywhere that we go. So we're here in Tamo at about 12,000 feet and this is the village that Chuang Nima is from and he died while we were climbing together. It was you know, one of the biggest tragedies of my life. And I came directly to, to this house after he died to tell his, his wife and to see his sons. And um, it took a little time, but the idea for the Juniper Fund for me was born out of watching the grief process for Lamu Chiki. You know, I think that I feel so fortunate that we have a support system in place for families of local workers who are killed while working in the mountains. You know, it is a new purpose and I'm not doing this because it's a nice thing to have on my resume. I'm doing this because it's something that I absolutely think is vital to fulfill an obligation that we have for utilizing the services of local workers. We have to support their families when things go wrong. We have to be able to do that. We woke up this morning to thick clouds and a light dusting of snow that had continued from yesterday. So we think it's time to get out of Gorak Shep and head into base camp. We're going to start walking and in a few hours we're going to get to base camp and that's going to be our home for the next couple months. Our Everest Base Camp is at around 17,800 feet. Everest Base Camp is quite a strange place. It's nothing like anywhere else I've ever been in the world. You can have a lot of climbing experience elsewhere, but it's still totally different from anything you're ever gonna experience anywhere else. I would guess around 800 people right now at the start of the season who are gonna be climbing. That's a lot of people, and so it requires some communication and coordination to make sure that everybody's trying to climb as safely as possible. Take us back to the day of the earthquake. So we went and climbed Lobache Peak on the 24th. Our intention was to sleep on the summit and our entire climbing team of four people um, went to the summit of Lobache. And it started snowing the afternoon while we were climbing and the snow really continued almost all night, off and on. And when I woke up in the morning, the morning of the 25th, it was still snowing. 
So we stopped in Lobache Village to drop off our climbing equipment and have lunch, and we were just sitting in the building, and um, Ben was sitting against the wall, and he said, oh, earthquake. And we've just walked a couple hours downhill, not knowing if the earthquake was anywhere else, and it's very clearly here in this village, and it actually looks quite a bit worse here. So we're gonna keep heading down the valley and see what we find, but we definitely hope that nobody up at base camp felt the effects of this earthquake. And so we sort of talked about it. It was like, where, where do you think the center of this was? And I used the satellite phone to call Seattle, and immediately I knew that there was a problem. I knew that it was bigger than, than I thought. And um, you know, what, what my goals are and what my desires are just, just don't matter right now.